Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm here with Steve Hanna of Infineon. We're going to talk today about the growing need for security on IoT devices. In the past, when we thought about security, it was typically an application that you'd load onto your computer. As we go forward, though, we're dealing with much different devices, some of them in the field, some of them in your office, and they have very different requirements, right? That's exactly right. Uh, embedded systems have very diverse uh, situations and requirements. So if we think, for example, about door locks, you might say, well, I understand the security requirements for a door lock has to keep the door locked. Yes, that's true, but it's different depending on whether it's the front door of your house or the door of a commercial establishment a bank or a government facility. So you can see there are different levels. And then there are completely different kinds of security. The security you're gonna put in that door lock is completely different from what you're going to put in say a temperature sensor or a security camera or a smoke detector. So, uh, or a children's uh, toy. There are all sorts of different requirements with embedded. The challenge is that now you have all these devices connected. So in the past, you thought about, okay, you had a, a, a smart uh, door lock. The problem is that that is now connected into your home network. Or if you have something in an office, it's now connected to something else that previously was never connected to, right? That's exactly right. When we add that connectivity, that IoT connectivity, there's a security risk there. All IoT devices are inherently connected. And through that connection can come attacks, um, infections, all sorts of things. So uh, we have to recognize that risk and then manage that risk. That's what security is all about, understanding risks and figuring out how to manage them. Steve, let's dig into this. Sure. Steve, what are we looking at here? Here we're looking at a typical IoT environment. We've got some device there, that robot arm, and uh, it's connected up through a network to the cloud. Um, there's even potentially some consumable, uh, which is in there. Maybe that's your 3D printer uh, material or whatever this robot arm is using. So what's changed over what was there in the past? Well, previously, these things would be standalone. You'd have your embedded system and uh, it would operate uh, just as a standalone device that we've had for a long time. What happens now is that these devices are connected to the cloud. It gives us lots of capabilities. It gives us the ability to do data analytics on that uh, particular device and to compare it to other devices, to do predictive maintenance, to say, oh, the robot arm is getting sort of you know, stiff and we know what happens then. It needs to have some oil where it's going to need to have a part replaced. And it gives us the ability to remotely access that device and maybe push down some firmware updates to it and improvements to it. But it also brings security risks. Basically what's happening is if you can connect to something, something else that can connect to you, is there now some sort of thinking going on that says, well, not everything really should be connected or not everything should be connected the way it has been in the past? How do we change that so that this becomes more secure? Well, as you said, uh, these things, these attacks can come at any point in the system, not just attacks on the device, but attacks on the network, attacks on the cloud, and even attacks on the consumables. So it's not so much that we don't want to connect them. That's where the goodness comes of IoT, uh, all of this cloud intelligence. It's that we want to connect them carefully and in a protected manner. You could say we want to connect them securely. So how well have people been doing with this? Well, I'm sorry to say not so well. <laughs> Security has been a real problem for IoT. In fact, it's a leading barrier to IoT adoption. People say, you know, I'm not sure that I'm ready to buy quite yet. I'm not sure that the devices are quite secure yet. And one of the reasons is all the headlines that we see about IoT security breaches, whether it be Stuxnet or Mirai or whatnot, 
uh, it seems that there is a new IoT security breach every week. Um, and we also know that in independent evaluations, IoT devices have found to be consistently lacking in adequate security. In addition, we don't have the cybersecurity experts on hand to solve these problems. And so what we need to do is we need to take a more systematic approach. Instead of expecting every IoT company to become an IoT security expert, we need to build the security into the underlying standards, the underlying platforms, so that then companies can go ahead and take advantage of that and have it automatically included in their products. And we're starting to see laws being developed uh, across various geographies in the world uh, right now. You've got uh, liability laws coming out of uh, Europe. You've got liability laws coming out of California. Have these helped? They do help. Um, and here's how I think about it. We need to raise the bar. We need to establish a common set of expectations for our IoT cybersecurity. And uh, our governments are responding to these daily incidents um, and, uh, and problems with IoT cybersecurity in different ways. Some are using a carrot approach and some are using a stick. Either way, uh, it's good strong incentive for manufacturers to implement strong cybersecurity. Either they got the carrot of increased revenues and sales if they do so, or they've got the stick that they won't be able to sell in a particular geography if they don't do so. Most people tend to think of security in terms of layers too, right? So one layer is not sufficient. You need multiple layers going up. How does that actually work? Well, if we go back to that diagram we saw earlier with the devices connected through the network and up to the cloud, we need security at each of those layers. In order for the devices to communicate securely with the cloud, they need to authenticate themselves. So you know you're actually talking to that door lock that you want to be able to remotely unlock. And they certainly need to authenticate the cloud itself because the last thing we want is some attacker able to come in and send an unlock command without strong authentication. We need to think about other kinds of security too though. Since the network cannot always be trusted, uh, the network itself can contain adversaries, uh, eavesdroppers, if you will, and we need to secure the connectivity uh, over that network, including confidentiality and replay protections, all these things. And finally, and arguably most important, we need to include a secure software update capability for those IoT devices. Without that, uh, it's not possible to fix problems, security issues in particular, when they arise out in the field. And you and I both know, you know, you, constant updates is just a, a fact of life today, whether it's your smartphone or your laptop. Um, new problems are discovered and new problems need to be fixed out in the field in a safe way. And we're starting to see this in other areas that typically weren't included under the IoT banner, right? So automobiles uh, that are increasingly connected and electrified, you're starting to see it in the grids that are, are connected to everything, smart cities. These are all IoT infrastructures, right? Absolutely. I like to say that IoT is not a single market. It is a transformational trend, sort of like electrification has been for the last hundred and some years, where you know, in 1880, how many things were electrified? Not many. Fast forward 100 or 120 years, and pretty much everything was electrified. The same is becoming true with IoT, and it's moving much more quickly. Everything from our home and our business environment to farms, for that matter, trains, planes, really everything is becoming smart becoming smart by connecting it out to the cloud. So uh, all of these devices have their own need for cybersecurity, just not necessarily 
the same cybersecurity level for all of them. No matter how good this is, you're still going to be attacked at some point. And you take a look at most of the logs that people see, even on their, their home computers, there are scripts out there which are, are trying to get into almost everything on a regular basis. What kinds of attacks do you have to worry about and how do you actually solve them? The attacks really fall into two categories. There's what we call logical attacks, where it's an attack on the logic that's executing in the device, the software. And then there are physical attacks where it's an attack on the hardware. Now, uh, logical attacks are the things that we most commonly think of. Perhaps there's a vulnerability in the software, a bug that can be used to say overrun a buffer and execute some code simply by sending a message to that device over the network, over its normal interfaces. But when we think about a embedded device, an IoT device, but we have to think about physical access to the device as well. So that door lock, you know, can somebody go there and tamper with it? Can they, you know, uh, push a button on it or twist a knob that's going to cause it to open? And any IoT device can be subject to these sorts of physical attacks. So just to take an, an example, well, we drive our cars and then we park them and other people can tamper with them. Yes, but it's also true that I, as a owner of a car, can tamper with my own car. Perhaps I want to boost the performance, you know, but uh, forego the uh, emissions controls. Or maybe I want to find a vulnerability in that car that then I could exploit remotely in other similar cars. This happened, uh, Miller and Balachek a few years ago uh, discovered vulnerability in a whole class of different cars. They bought one of the cars, they started looking at it, and they found a remote message that they could send that would allow them to seize control of the steering, the brakes, the acceleration, the windshield wipers, and the radio of all of those cars just by seeing, sending a remote message. So we have to think not just about protecting against logical attacks, but also about against physical ones. And the countermeasures that we use vary depending on whether we're protecting against logical attacks, in which case you use very conventional cybersecurity methods or protecting against those more sophisticated physical attacks, in which case we use tamper resistant hardware and secure hardware in particular uh, to protect against those sorts of attacks. So in this slide, we described some of the different countermeasures that are used and that uh, the different kinds of attacks that can be mounted and the different countermeasures that are used and implemented. We'll never actually solve this problem. You think about security, it's really since the dawn of civilization, you've had security issues that you've had to guard against and they just become more and more sophisticated and you deal with them as you go. Are we getting to the point now where we need to add this kind of basically resiliency into devices as they're designed so that you can do these updates, that you can actually plan for if this is compromised, we know what to do, or at least we have some sort of methodology and, and approach and solution? Yes, I think every embedded system designer now needs to be thinking about cybersecurity uh, because it's a fact of life. Uh, these devices, even the ones that aren't connected, are now subject to more sophisticated attacks um, because the attackers have become aware of what's possible. Uh, they are fascinated by taking them apart and tampering with them and finding these vulnerabilities. So uh, regardless of whether it's IoT or not, we need to think about cybersecurity from the conception of the product through the design and implementation of the product, and then through all throughout its installed life cycle, since we need to be able to install updates to the software or firmware out there in the field and keep these things secure as long as they're in use. This is an increasingly complicated design challenge though too, right? Because now we have to think about, you have active security, you're dealing, you're drawing power, you're taking up area, and you're actually potentially impacting performance as well. Yes, and that's why it's so valuable to have chipsets that have security built into them. So that then by implementing these security measures in hardware, 
we're able to optimize them for power. We're able to optimize them for area. We're able to optimize them in all those different ways. And then you don't have the overhead of trying to make up in software for the deficiencies of the hardware. Typically, when you build a, a system or a network, not everything was developed at the same time. And the latest devices have probably better security than the older devices. How do you account for that? Well, yes, legacy is a fact of life. And if we think about uh, our IoT model that I showed earlier, you can recognize that some of the components here are going to be maybe five, 10, or even more years old. Um, and at a certain point in time, they become obsolete from a security standpoint. It doesn't mean that that robot arm isn't still picking and and pulling things and moving them. It may be perfectly functional, but from a security standpoint, it may not be secure. And what we do at that point is we don't throw the robot arm out. We keep the robot arm operating, but we have to treat it like a very delicate baby. If you expose it to any sort of uh, potential outside contact, it can become infected because it doesn't have a modern defensive system. And a typical example would be cryptographic algorithms. The algorithms we use today are not the ones we used 20 years ago. And if you took a Windows 95 box and tried to put it on the network now, it might work, yeah, but only until a nasty packet came in and infected it. The same is gonna be true of your robot arm. And so you, you isolate it, you compartmentalize it, you make sure that it only ever talks to uh, trustworthy systems that it was designed to talk to. Initially, when we thought about the IoT, it was basically an end device that would communicate almost everything to the cloud and then back. Much more intelligence is coming into the end device because it's very expensive to move that data from a variety of different standpoints, resources, as well as cost and, and also time. As we start adding some more intelligence into the edge, as well as the end device, does the paradigm here start to shift? Do we start seeing security in different layers and different places than we had in the past? And how do they interact? Certainly, yes. One of the benefits of edge computing is that things can be done locally. Things can even be done when you're disconnected from the cloud. Whereas without that, if the cloud isn't there, you don't have any of the smarts. So there are a lot of benefits that you've described. But it means that there must be a level of trust between the device and the edge. And that trust needs to be based on good foundation. So the edge computing system itself needs to be well secured. Uh, and then there needs to be that mutual authentication, that secured communication, and that software firmware update capability built into that edge computing device as well. The end device needs to be able to verify that the edge computing system is authorized to send it commands and to perform certain operations and vice versa. They have to establish a paired and secured relationship between the two. And you have to make sure that that edge computing device, especially if it's providing security protections, cocooning, if you will, for an old and vulnerable edge device has all the latest updates and all the latest security capabilities that it's filtering out all of the attacks and keeping them away from the uh, end device. Steve Hanna, thanks for a great explanation. Ed, it's been a pleasure.